was Pop Mail. Before Murder, Inc. was a successful gold mine of a record label, its co-founder Irv Gotti would come to prominence in the streets of New York City as DJ Irv. In his capacity as a DJ, Irv Gotti would work with fellow Queens native rapper Mike Geronimo, who he initially met at a Queens high school talent show on his 1995 debut album The Natural, and a very young Ja Rule during his time with Cash Money Click beginning in 1994. Gotti would also go on to develop relationships with both Jay-Z and DMX during his time working with Def Jam Records. In fact, Ja Rule appeared on Mike Geronimo's DJ Irv produced track Time to Build in 1995 featuring both DMX and Jay-Z prior to their mainstream fame. After Irv Gotti spent some time working with Russell Simmons to help rebuild the success of Def Jam, Simmons decided to give Gotti his own label under the banner of Def Jam. While watching the television series biography on A&E during their Gangster Week programming, Gotti noticed a Murder, Inc. logo pop up on the screen. Gotti knew that he wanted to make his name by putting out hit records, or as he put it, murder hits. When deciding what to name his label, he believed that the best name to convey his music industry dreams would be Murder, Inc. By 1998, Irv Gotti would establish Murder, Inc. alongside his brother Chris. The label's initial roster would include Queens rappers Ja Rule and Black Child, who both joined in 97, Nemesis, who would join a year later in 98, R&B vocalist Christina Milian, and rappers Cadillac Ta and Vita, who would each join in 1999. But what led to the rise and fall of Murder, Inc., a label that would be dominant in the rap, R&B, and pop airwaves in the first decade of the 2000s, and what would be their approach to their business? Was it the way they conducted it? Was it their ongoing beef with other prominent members of hip-hop or their encounters with the Internal Revenue Service, also known as the IRS, that would lead to their eventual collapse as a label and their downfall? Gotti's label, Murder, Inc., officially came onto the scene in 1999 with the release of Ja Rule's album, Veni Vedi Vecchi, which featured the hit single, Holla Holla. Soon after, the album went platinum in the U.S., catapulting Ja Rule and the Murder, Inc. label into an entirely new level of fame. A year later, the label continued to expand, first with its new association with the vocalist and rapper Lil Mo, who would go on to record two duets that year with Ja Rule, then with the release of Murder, Inc.'s first compilation record, Irv Gotti Presents The Murderers, and then with the signing of both rapper Charlie Baltimore, who would first leave the label in 2004, then return for two years in 2008, and R&B vocalist Ashanti who would remain with the label until her departure in 2008. No sooner did Murder, Inc. sign Lil Mo than their friendship with the artist began to sour. The minor label beef intensified once Lil Mo discovered that the track she had recorded for Ja Rule's third studio album had either been cut or replaced with the contributions of other female artists. These decisions at Murder, Inc. would eventually lead to Lil Mo deciding to cut ties with the label just as they were entering their mainstream music peak. Between mid-2001 and early 2003, Murder, Inc. would reach its peak of success and mainstream visibility with the release of Ja Rule's multi-platinum selling album Pain Is Love and Ashanti's multi-platinum and self-titled debut album, which spawned three hit singles on the Billboard charts. In that same year, Charlie Baltimore achieved two hit singles alongside Ashanti and Ja Rule, vocalist Lloyd signed with the label, and Irv Gotti decided to begin business talks with Nas and Bobby Brown, who would eventually be signed to Murder, Inc. In 2007, Murder, Inc. would even go as far as to sign singer-songwriter Vanessa Carlton, an unconventional signing for a hip-hop label. Before 50 Cent came to mainstream fame with his debut album Get Rich or Die Tryin', as an up-and-coming rapper, 50 Cent used interesting tactics to garner public attention, one of which was his notorious 1999 recording How to Rob, where he called out rap music heavyweights like Jay-Z, Mace, DMX, and Big Pun by name. While the streets were buzzing with interest in 50 Cent, he had not yet achieved the success or visibility that Ja Rule had with his contemporary debut album Veni Vedi Veshi, though the two would eventually bump heads a conflict that would result in 50 Cent waging war on Ja Rule and the staff and crew of his label Murder, Inc. To date, this beef is one of hip-hop's longest and most heated conflicts that still kind of goes on. In 1999, there were reports that Ja Rule had been robbed at gunpoint in Southside Jamaica, Queens for his chain. Weeks later, claims emerged that Ja Rule had witnessed 50 Cent spending time with the culprit of Ja Rule's robbing in a club. While that moment would be a spark that lit the flame of the conflict between the rappers, Ja Rule later confirmed that he had not seen 50 Cent with the man in question. Instead, 
Ja Rule claimed that 50 Cent's real anger toward him stemmed from being snubbed by Murder, Inc. during a video shoot for Ja Rule's singer Murder for Life featuring Memphis Bleak. In October of the same year, 50 Cent released his record Life's on the Line, which most fans agreed was a deliberate diss record directed towards Murder, Inc. and Ja Rule, even though the record does explicitly name Ja Rule. Fans made that assessment based on the fact that 50 Cent directly mocked Murder, Inc.'s signature Murder chant throughout the recording, the single that would go on to peak at number 37 on the Billboard Hot Rap Singles chart, and garner some street attention. Immediately after 50 Cent released the single, he and Ja Rule encountered one another at an Atlanta nightclub, where the two were booked to perform. There, the two rappers got into a heated exchange which quickly escalated into a physical altercation and the two rappers' necklaces breaking. A member of 50 Cent's team quickly recovered Ja Rule's chain, and 50 Cent's team then brokered a deal with Ja Rule to get his chain back. The deal included receiving a Movado watch in exchange for Ja's chain, a claim that Ja Rule denies. By 2000, both Murder, Inc. and G-Unit, the crew that was associated with 50 Cent, would encounter one another at the Hit Factory Studios in New York City after Ja Rule received word that 50 Cent was there recording. Ja Rule decided to show up and pay 50 Cent and his crew a visit, which later led to a physical altercation. From this encounter, 50 Cent was stabbed and Ja Rule and Black Child were both arrested. Black Child would later take credit for stabbing 50 Cent. Two years later, 50 Cent would release his fifth mixtape, No Mercy, No Fear after inking a million dollar deal with Shady Aftermath Records. One of the more popular recordings from his August 2002 release was Wangsta, where 50 Cent takes shots at a figure inspired by Ja Rule. The single would become 50 Cent's first hit, peaking at the 13th position on the Billboard Hot 100. Shortly thereafter in November, Irv Gotti told the star in Buckwild Morning Show that 50 Cent had signed an order of protection against him and Ja Rule. Fans claimed that Gotti's disclosure of this information was intended to paint 50 Cent as an informant and question his street credibility. In response, 50 Cent denied the allegations, though it has since been confirmed that the order of protection does exist and that the NYPD issued it on behalf of 50 Cent as a mere formality. After Gotti criticized 50 Cent for being a snitch, 50 Cent quickly responded in the form of a mixtape titled G-Unit The Future Is Now. The mixtape contained a number of recordings and interludes attacking Murder, Inc. One even went as far as to satirize Ja Rule's singing. In January 2003, the offices of Violator Records and Violator Management, the team that handled 50 Cent's career, were attacked by an unknown gunman who opened fire. Thankfully, no employees or artists were injured in the attacks. That said, there were also no arrests made either, even as early reports of the incident did tie the incident to the ongoing conflict between 50 Cent and Ja Rule. Onlookers estimated that this shooting incident was evidence that the conflict between the two rappers had escalated and there was likely no going back. Across 2003, 50 Cent and Ja Rule continued to take shots at one another on record. In February, 50 Cent released his debut album Get Rich or Die Trying, which charted at the number one spot on the Billboard 200. On the album's Dr. Dre produced track Back Down, which was ultimately not released as a single, 50 Cent questioned Ja Rule and Murder Inc.'s authenticity and street credibility. By April, Ja Rule fired back in his diss track, Loose Change. On the recording, he took aim at 50 Cent and G-Unit, Eminem and his daughter Haley, Dr. Dre, Busta Rhymes, and even Chris Lighty, who was 50 Cent's manager. One week later, 50 Cent, Eminem, and Busta Rhymes responded in a recording titled Hail Mary, which critiqued Ja Rule's character and his infatuation with Tupac Shakur. Ja Rule then responded with his jab, Guess Who Shot Ya, in which he rapped over a classic Biggie instrumental. He then expanded his discussion to 50 Cent and G-Unit on his fifth album, Blood In My Eye, which was released in November 2003. Many agree that the album represented Ja Rule's first quantifiable loss in the battle due to the fact that it did not have the same success as his earlier multi-platinum releases. After 2003, while the beef between 50 Cent, Ja Rule, and Murder, Inc. quelled in terms of its public visibility, there were several notable moments across the years where the rappers continued to throw jabs at one another. In 2007, during a Hot 97 interview hosted by Angie Martinez, Ja Rule accused 50 Cent of reproducing his sound after 50 Cent signed his large record deal with Shady Aftermath. Five years later, after Ja Rule pled guilty to federal tax evasion, 50 Cent used this moment to criticize the rapper on the social media platform Twitter. When Ja Rule met with Angie Martinez yet again in 2013, he admitted that, in his opinion, Murder Inc. had lost a feud. Among the cited reasons for the loss was the federal investigation into the label Murder Inc. In addition, due to 50 Cent's rising popularity, much of the public appeared to have taken 50 Cent's side over Ja Rule's. 
Years later, the feud was lit up again during a performance for the Versus platform. After witnessing a series of messages on Instagram, Irv Gotti began responding to fans who mentioned his name and the beef with 50 Cent. Gotti was on record writing, All y'all talking that 50 stuff, all good. He got beat up, stabbed up, shot up, and sued us. That's all I'm gonna say. Your hero ain't what you think he is, period, and facts. 50 Cent would eventually respond to the situation by stating, What the hell am I trending for? I said I ain't doing whatever that stuff is they doing. I put their whole label out of business. F with me if you want to. I would stay out of my way if I wasn't me. LOL. The comments also led to Ja Rule publicly responding as well by calling into the Big Tigger morning show. Irv told Big Tigger, you know, the Fed's tactics. That's what they do. They treated us like a criminal mob organization. And when they do that, what they do is they suck all your resources. They shut you down financially. They take down your bank accounts. They take all your assets. They seize everything so that you can't fight. So how you think I'm fighting a rap battle? I'm fighting a real fight. And then on top of it all, come on, man. I'm battling 17 rappers. It ain't like I was just battling 50 Cent. He likes to throw his hat on like he was the guy. Man, stop. Eminem made you, created you. You're nothing with that effing white boy. Stop it. In 2003, reports indicated that the federal government had raided the offices of Murder, Inc., the Def Jam subsidiary. The raid began with a two-year-long case against Chris and Irv Gotti, who were required by law to prove that Murder, Inc. had not functioned as a money laundering operation for Kenneth Supreme McGriff of Queen's legendary Supreme team. Despite their multi-platinum success, Murder, Inc. was still questioned about its affiliation with McGriff after Gotti decided to fund a movie titled Crime Partners that he directed. In the aftermath of the raid, life at the Murder, Inc. offices changed tremendously. By that time, Gotti had spent upwards of $10 million in legal fees fighting the case, and over the course of the entire trial, the label had no distribution. On December 2, 2005, the jury overseeing the details of the case decided to acquit the Gottis of all charges. They beat a federal case. Following the trial, Murder, Inc. decided to drop the moniker of murder in an effort to transform their public reputation. On December 4, 2003, Irv Gotti decided to hold a press conference at the Riga Royal Hotel in Manhattan, alongside Russell Simmons and Dr. Benjamin Chavez regarding recent changes with his label Murder, Inc., and to discuss the ongoing feuds and the IRS investigation. During this press conference, Irv Gotti announced that Murder, Inc. would be changing the name of their label to The Inc. Gotti claimed that the name change was meant to shed any negativity that was associated with their label. It was at the same press conference that Gotti stated that he had initially intended to name Murder, Inc. Lockdown Records. He maintained that his current decision to rename his label Murder, Inc. came after speaking with Minister Louis Farrakhan of the Nation of Islam and Russell Simmons. Gotti recalled, I'm like, damn, we just made a classic record, and they just want to focus on that word murder. We want to be good people. You got to do what's in your heart, and you got to do what's right. And yet, despite changing the label name, Gotti stated that he would not be changing his own professional name to drop the Gotti from his entertainment persona because Jay-Z had been the one to bestow that name upon him. During the question and answer segment of the press conference, a reporter asked Irv Gotti about his opinion on Eminem and a series of tapes that had recently emerged that were created approximately 10 years ago at that point, where the rapper was using racial epitaphs to describe black people. In his response, Gotti stated, I'm a defender of black women. You can listen to our records. Everything that we do is about a man and woman riding for each other. So I can't give him no pass. Those words, his apology, are far worse than the tape. I ain't riding with that. People know that we got problems with them. Where is C. Dolores Tucker? Where is Dion Warwick? It makes me question my faith in my people. Simmons, on the other hand, stated that he accepted Eminem's public apology for the use of those words, and this decision to accept Eminem's apology ultimately put Simmons at odds with the Source magazine and prompted its co-owner, Dave Mays, to resign from the board of Simmons' Hip Hop Summit Action Network. By the end of 2004, Murder, Inc., now known as The Inc., was ordered to leave the Def Jam offices while the IRS investigations were ongoing. Once trials began in early 2005, Def Jam had decided to make The Inc. honor their contracts and release compilation albums. However, for much of 2005 and part of 2006, The Inc. spent much of their time searching for distribution given that they were not re-signed by Def Jam. The Inc. first approached Lior Cohen at Warner, who offered them a deal which involved Warner buying The Inc., that also included making Gotti the head of the Inc. as well as Atlantic. Despite the deal, Gotti was worried that he would not be paid enough in this role, and he and the members of the Inc. ultimately decided to end talks with Warner. Gotti then entered into talks with Capital and Interscope. 
While it appeared that the Inc. was about to sign with Atlantic, Universal Records decided to offer Gotti a seven-year deal, which was in part financed by a national talent agency out of Southern California, 50% ownership of the Inc.'s materials, and a job as A&R with a higher-paying role. By early 2006, the Inc. decided to sign to Universal and soon began signing artists and releasing music, including the work of Vanessa Carlton. By 2009, Irv Gotti would first announce that he would be releasing Ashanti from her contract, and a month later, Lloyd would ask to be released from his contract as well. That same year, fellow Murder, Inc. artist Ja Rule would also announce that he was no longer signed to the label and would be going independent through his own label, Empire, which was distributed through Fontana. A year later, Charlie Baltimore would also decide to leave Murder, Inc. in search of new opportunities. When it's all said and done, Murder, Inc. Records was a hit factory that was unfortunately interrupted by many of the outside street beef as well as legal elements that surrounded its members, making it hard for the label to just strictly stick to music. But with all the gold, platinum, and multi-platinum plaques that once decorated their walls, it's safe to say that Murder, Inc.'s music helped define the sound coming out of clubs and cars all across the United States through the late 90s to the mid-2000s. And now we may see some resurfacing of Murder, Inc. because Irv Gotti had just been celebrating recently about signing a multiple nine-figure deal where he would get about half of the money and then half of the money they were going to invest in him for future projects whether it be film or music related.